We began this program looking at how to bring peace to Afghanistan after yet another deadly attack in the capital. That conversation is all the more timely considering it's now officially the least peaceful place on the planet. The 2019 Global Peace Index, published by the Institute for Economics and Peace, ranks Afghanistan last below Syria. And with reports of conflict and crises raging across the globe, you'd easily think the world is less peaceful today than it was last year. But for the first time in five years, the Global Peace Index has actually improved. But how? Well, let's ask Steve Killelaire, who oversaw the report. He's the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace. Uh, Steve, good to have you on the program. So a lot of people would look at that and ask, well, you know, how and based on what? Metrics. I, for example, the first thing you do when you look at these lists, you look at where you come from and where your country ranks. I'm a, I'm a South African and I live in Turkey, right? So I looked at the list and I saw that South Africa was 127th and Turkey is 152nd. And that's what, 25 positions lower than South Africa. And I thought, no, that can't be right because I can walk around the streets of Turkish cities late at night and feel safe with my kids but not really in South Africa. So is the metric not about crime? Is it about terrorism? So, you know, these things cook up all sorts of questions. So if you can, help us understand, in, in a nutshell, how do we get to define this and how do we get to produce this list? Sure. No, that's uh, quite happy to do that. So if we look at it, there are three different domains which we measure, and they have 23 different composite indicators. So the first the dimensions, internal safety and security. So that measure things like the level of violent crime, the homicide rates, the availability of small arms, incarceration rates, number of police, number of terrorist attacks, uh, state-sponsored uh, terror and other such things. Uh, the next the three domains is, the in, is internal and external conflict. And that's mm -hmm. probably self-evident. And the final one is militarization. Now, we look at the uh, structure of the index. It gets derived from a definition, which is the absence of violence or fear of violence. And we have an international expert committee which over oversees it, which consists of experts in peace and statistics who right. then determine what indicators we use, the weight of those indicators, the sources of the information we get uh, aren't our own judgments. So you, we do construct a couple of the indicators, but it's mainly sourced from the best sources we can uh, available globally. People would understand why Afghanistan, Syria, South Sudan, these are at the bottom of the list because terrible wars are happening in these places. Yemen, for example. I guess they'd also understand why a place like Iceland is fairly peaceful, no internal conflicts, quite remote, and so on. But when the report comes out and a part of the extrapolation and interpretation is that the world in general is getting more peaceful. They look at the news cycle and part of our job is to only report on <laughs> the problems and the terrible things, right? They find it hard to believe that the world is actually a more peaceful place than it was last year. Is that a surprising so, so let's, interpretation? Yeah, let's yeah, look, no, I don't, I don't think it is, because if we go back to 2014 and the index has been dropping every year since then, up until this year, it was really on the back of the rise of, the, uh, of ISIS, uh, I, the way it then unleashed its terror through Iraq and then moved on in through Syria. And what we've seen over the last 18 months is pretty much the territorial defeat of ISIS. We can also see that there's 13% less uh, yeah, uh, deaths from the conflict in Syria, let's say. And that's the reason that Syria has moved up. Afghanistan really hasn't changed in terms of the wars, mm -hmm. but Syria is just slightly, slightly mm -hmm. more peaceful. Now, to put it in context, if we look around the globe, uh, what we'll find is that peace improved just very slightly, very, very slightly. Uh, but when you look at it, we found that 86 countries did improve while 76 dropped. If we look at the news cycles, we've always, and that's the nature of the news, is to focus on quite often the problems of the world and occasionally small blessings which we get. 
But if we go back over the last decade, we find that visas dropped 3.7%. Right. And over that period of time, we've had the uh, 81 countries become more peaceful and 81, deteri 81 countries deteriorate. So we look at those long-term trends, uh, what we'll find the things which have really caused the deterioration have been really the wars in the Middle East, that's particularly Iraq and Syria, then the knock-on effects from that with the refugees and then the terrorism, which uh, mm -hmm. ISIS spread and Turkey has certainly suffered from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any, any shining examples of those small blessings that you mentioned? Any countries that are rapidly yeah. going up? Yes. Well, what we, what we find is quite often after the back of a conflict, you find that there's a, or a big drops in peace. You find there'll be increases. So we're looking this year. Sudan was one of the ones which did increase, but the cutoff date was before. That was the 31st of March, which was before, before the recent unrest. And Egypt also, after the series of uh, issues which it's had over the last five years, it's bounded quite a bit too. But if we go right to the top of the index, probably the standout there is Bhutan. So if we go back over the last 13 years, it's increased 43 places on the index, now stand mm -hmm. at number 15. Yeah, so part of your statistics here say that violence is costing the world more than $14 trillion a year, and that number equates to 11.2% of world economic activity. I wonder, when you put out that figure, what are you trying to tell people? Well, what I'm trying to say is that the, uh, the cost of violence to the global economy is significant. If we can reduce that, that then frees up a econo economic wealth, which can then be mm -hmm. put into other areas, which can then stimulate and improve the global economy. So, right. it's, it's, right. so violence comes with an economic cost. And one of the things which I think is really important with the index, we're not making moral judgments about where countries stand. Yes, let's face it, you to Syria, uh, you're going to yeah. get a lot of very nasty spillover effects. Right. Because you need a big, so, need a big yeah. military. Right, uh, of course. You've because got you're gonna, violent criminal. Sorry to interrupt you, but you're going to get people who say, yes, it's, it's all well and good. I'd love to use that money to build schools and hospitals and put it into education and so on, but I'm fighting a terrorist group. Let the less bad guys defeat the more bad guys first, and then we'll put that money to good use. So with that in mind... I guess you're never expecting to go out of business anytime soon, are you? <laughs> Somehow, look, I don't think any of us can actually imagine a world which is absolutely peaceful. Uh, it hasn't existed in history, doesn't do now. But we can all probably imagine a world which could be 10% mm -hmm. more peaceful. Now, if you look at that, that's about $1.4 trillion. Now, $1.4 trillion is the size of all foreign direct investment last year, or put it another way, it's the size of the total economies of, let's say, Ireland, Denmark, and Switzerland. So these are large amounts of money. Even 1% of the cost right. of violence to the global economy is $140 billion, mm -hmm. and that's the size of all overseas developmental aid. Steve Killalek, good to talk to you on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us.